Yeah, we're uh, we're exploring this theme. What is enlightenment? Which uh, you can't really evade, can you? Uh, <laughs> uh, enormous as the theme is, daunting as the task is to talk about enlightenment, uh, you can't really evade it. You can't really sort of um, talk about Buddhism without, um, yeah, whilst avoiding enlightenment. Um, and uh, as you heard, um, Kalyanadi last week left us on the cusp. Uh, of a dawning of a new kind of consciousness. Um, the Buddha had determined to sit down uh, and not not get up until he had gained enlightenment. Um, so it's quite a sort of thrilling moment, isn't it? Um, um, a sort of pivotal, pivotal moment in history, you could say. Um, at the same time, it's um, it's tricky, isn't it? Because uh, when we talk about enlightenment, it can sound a little bit like uh, um, like either you're enlightened or you're not, and there's a truth to that. Uh, but it, but all too easily, uh, it can sound a little bit like it's so so far away. You have to do all this practice to get anywhere near it. Um, uh, what's it got to do with me? It can almost seem sort of. Uh, uh, irrelevant to me right now, but that is to sort of misunderstand what's being got at with enlightenment. It's more like the Buddha is saying that he's discovered what consciousness really is. So perhaps another way of looking at it is that we have misperceived consciousness. We have fundamentally misperceived consciousness um, <clears throat> and therefore we experience life um, uh, in a very sort of mixed kind of way. So this reminds me of, of before I was a Buddhist, um, I became a Buddhist or got involved with Buddhism when I was about 20. So um, this is going back a bit, but um, I used to experience in life a kind of cycle. Um, I used to experience sort of moments of meaning where my life would make sense and would be sort of rich with meaning. Uh, and then it would disappear. Uh, and then it would come back again and it would disappear. I mean, you know, I was I was a teenager at this point. Uh, so teenage life can be like that. Um, but uh, I found it very, very uncomfortable because I couldn't make sense of it. Did life have meaning or not? Uh, surely that was a kind of uh, fixed thing. But what I experienced was a, like a, a massive sort of fluctuation. Um, <clears throat> and, I, you know, I did the same things that one day were meaningful. The next day they weren't. Um, so this is what the Buddha's getting at, that uh, actually uh, what life is about, that the meaning uh, that is inherent in life um, is to do with consciousness. It's to do with consciousness. And when we're divorced from that meaning, it's because uh, of consciousness, because of what we're doing with our, with our consciousness. So this is more what's been got at uh, with enlightenment. The Buddha had seen through, penetrated, uh, deeply, profoundly into the nature of consciousness, such that he experienced an unmitigated um, uh, life of meaning. Uh, it, enlightenment was said to be very blissful, sort of freed suddenly of all the tensions um, that uh, we experience. So I just, just want to sort of start by saying that, that it can seem like, oh, well, I'll worry about enlightenment later. But that's not really, that's not, that's sort of slightly missing the point. Uh, it, he is sort of saying, actually, you guys have misperceived consciousness, and it's really like this. Um, <clears throat> so, um, yeah, there was, the, there was the Buddha on the dawn of this sort of, the dawning of this new consciousness, uh, which really is the same consciousness, but just perceived uh, truly, if you see what I mean. The problem with saying perceived truly is it sounds like he just sort of changed his mind and saw, oh yeah, consciousness is like that. It doesn't sound quite so so kind of um, cataclysmic. Actually, the Buddha said it was, it was a sort of, um, it's sometimes talked about as a turning around in the deepest seat of consciousness. So it was sort of cataclysmic. There is this sort of irreversible change that is possible. That's what the Buddha is, is sort of telling us. But it doesn't mean that it's irrelevant until we get there, if you see what I mean. It's actually the nature of consciousness now, and it's it's because of that nature nature of consciousness that life has meaning and beauty um, and a certain sort of uh, pattern uh, to it. 
uh, deep within it. So, yeah, that's what we're actually kind of talking about. We're actually talking uh, not about sort of special interest group, people who are interested in enlightenment. We're talking about life. We're talking about the, 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 uh, the meaning uh, and uh, potential of consciousness, everybody's consciousness. And the fact that that can, that can drastically change, that can fundamentally change. Um, <clears throat> so, um, yeah, in talking about this, I want to, I want to, so in talking about what, what is enlightenment, we, um, we're going to be drawing, last week we were drawing on the biography, uh, the biography of the Buddha. A lot of those episodes are kind of communicated in mythic, symbolic terms. Uh, and in subsequent weeks, we're going to be exploring enlightenment through the language of myth. Uh, it's a very, very important language because of the difficulty of um, apprehending another kind of consciousness. Um, the language of myth can sort of reach further um, uh, into the unknown uh, than can the language of concepts basically but but this week I want to draw on the langu language of concepts because the Buddha did use uh, and gave a great importance to reason um, so uh, the way he talked about his experience um, is um, in these terms he said uh, when asked, well, it's not when he, when he was asked, but when he sought to try and communicate it, he said, this being, that becomes. From the arising of this, that arises. This not being, that does not become. From the ceasing of this, that ceases. Which, uh, I don't know about you, but when I first heard that, probably many of you heard it before, it leaves you a bit none the wiser, but some people on hearing that gained enlightenment. <laughs> they saw what he was getting at. Um, <clears throat> to us, it can seem a little bit cryptic, but essentially, um, well, perhaps one thing I should say is that uh, the Buddha wasn't sort of concerned personally to explain his experience. He didn't need to. Uh, so you're not, it's not like uh, some sort of, uh, the Buddha, some sort of beard going, well, I like to think of it like this, you know, uh, this being that becomes. Uh, it's not It's not actually a sort of uh, clever philosophy. What we're encountering here is the Buddha trying to break through, uh, trying to wake us up to say that another consciousness is possible. That's actually what we're, we're encountering. And um, he... Um, um, it's very, very interesting, kind of the the the, the language that he uses uh, to do that. He does appeal to us in terms that we can uh, use, or he appeals to us, you know, in reasoning concepts. Uh, so he appeals to the human capacity um, to reason, to reflect, to observe, and to act. Um, <clears throat> Uh, yeah, so he appeals to us as sort of spiritually responsible, basically. Um, it's quite different from the sort of the 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 uh, um, the sort of charismatic enig enigmatic voice of the prophet, isn't it? Where you sort of uh, you don't know what you're you can't make head and tail of what you're encountering. It is nonetheless a bit cryptic, isn't it? But essentially, what is being said is that things arise and fall independence upon supportive conditions, supporting conditions, or those conditions not being there, things fall away. So he's communicating this vision of a flow of conditions. Uh, this condition being here makes this condition possible. This disappearing, this goes. That's, that's essentially what he's saying. Um, it, and he's saying this to communicate his consciousness. Uh, this perspective of enlightenment, this consciousness of enlightenment. He's saying it's characterized by uh, this perception yeah, of this being that becomes this sort of flow of condition, this fluid uh, flowing um, vision of life. So, um, <clears throat> I think with this, uh, you know, it is a bit cryptic, uh, 
um, and it takes it's taken me quite a while to sort of um, quite make sense of what what's really been got at but um, reading the journey in the guide some of us are on the journey in the guide course at the moment uh, Jeanette is uh, is on it amongst others Craig there as well and Melissa yeah so uh, I've been skipping ahead and reading that and uh, there's one bit where Mike Chibandu is talking about this uh, he's talking about this this sort of almost sort of terse mathematical formula this being that becomes uh, that we call conditionality the, the, the central teaching central communication of enlightenment uh, of the Buddha uh, and he says what we're really encountering is an all-inclusive description of mind. Now that's almost all, almost all the more puzzling, isn't it? But an all an all-inclusive description of mind. So that's the way in which I want to sort of explore this, explore this teaching, and I, I want to um, um, I want to do that, calling on um, um, a very helpful. Uh, teaching that, that was compiled by a, a, a later Buddhist Buddha Gosha called the five niyamas. These five sort of groupings um, or if you like spheres of experience in which the Buddha is inviting us to observe um, that there is a relationship, um, <clears throat> there's a sort of flow of conditions, a, 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 a reliable um, flow of conditions um, or you could say kind of natural laws um, so I'm just going to talk I just so those are the Utu, ni Utu uh, Niyama the Biyaju Niyama and the Mano Niyama don't worry about these terms basically Utu means uh, inorganic so uh, he's saying look uh, at this this aspect of the external world um, <clears throat> through plate tectonics mountains arise through the law of gravity uh, you can rely rely that if you drop an apple it will hit the ground it will fall to the ground so he's saying these so there are these sort of regularities actually Kudapriya is going to be talking a bit more about um, about uh, the laws these are natural laws but yeah um, so he's saying look at that sphere of experience and then he's saying look at the Bija Niyama uh, which is this sphere of experience which is all which is organic uh, so uh, that has processes um, flows of conditions like photosynthesis um, <clears throat> uh, flows of conditions like uh, if you bring together soil, seed, sun, and water, uh, a tree arises. Yeah. So the the organic, uh, and then the manoniema is the sort of instinctive. Uh, so simple instincts, like um, as Subhadramati puts it, um, uh, when you smell vinegar and chips, your mouth waters. That just sort of happens. This is kind of natural flow of conditions such that that happens or more complex instinctual uh, processes like like the the way penguins uh, manage to find their way home uh, to the nesting uh, grounds how do they do that uh, so um, there are these uh, basically the external world he's talking about the external world so um, that is interesting, isn't it? The Buddha, the Buddha is talking about the external world. Um, <clears throat> well, why is he talking about the external world if he's trying to communicate about enlightenment? Why is he talking about the external world if he's trying to communicate about enlightenment? How does that tell us about enlightenment? And that's where we really need to understand what the Buddha means by mind, what the Buddha means by consciousness, because coming back to Maitre Bandhu's um, uh, explanation of conditionality it is an all-inclusive uh, description of mind so what that's getting at is our external world um, <clears throat> uh, the world out there that seems so sort of uh, tangible and substantial um, is actually in a lot of ways mind so what I mean by that is um, I was looking out my window um, whilst thinking about this, looking at that tree, uh, that walnut tree, and uh, what I see when I see that tree is a tree. Sure, it's a tree. That's what I see. That's what I've always seen. Well, is it? I mean, what, what we know is that uh, um, actually I see um, 
light that is reflected off that tree from this fiery ball in the sky we call the sun and um, <clears throat> uh, that is actually what I see that is actually what I see so um, defined by my senses I see a certain range of visible light that is reflected from that tree if I was a snake apparently some snakes can see infrared light so they can see heat so a snake would be able to perceive that tree uh, in the dark um, and it would see it in a different way it would apprehend it in a different way so to what extent do I really see the tree to what extent do I really know what I'm talking about when I say tree well I don't really it's actually sort of um, a matter of perception and um, what's what's more important about that is it's um, um, I can't actually know that what I see is what is there all I can say is that that light bouncing off it uh, appears to me in this sort of uh, well this 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 um, visual impression that's all I know uh, so I can't actually for definite know uh, what is there um, but what we can see if we observe our experience is that actually it's uh, <laughs> uh, we can see that um, we don't see things as they are we actually see them more as we are um, so uh, I was um, I was also looking at my chair uh, you could, I was doing this uh, preparing this talk in my room obviously uh, <laughs> this is a lockdown talk so looking at my chair um, <clears throat> uh, surely I know what a chair is uh, so as I was looking at it I was calling to mind this uh, uh, this teaching uh, this being that becomes and just sort of holding that in my mind, looking at the chair and trying to sort of see it through this teaching. And what became apparent was that my chair is going to at some point fall apart. Um, now, that is not how I usually see it. Actually, it is falling apart at the moment. It's broken. <laughs> but I, I usually gloss over that. And that is because I see things uh, as, um, as I am, if you like, or I see them in terms of the, their use to me. Uh, the chair... Uh, works very well for me when I want to sit down. I use it a lot actually um, uh, and that is how I see it. I see it essentially as something that's um, uh, that sort of functions for me. I don't see it as something uh, that um, uh, is conditioned, uh, will sort of um, will break down at some point when the conditions uh, on which it arises sort of fall away. So to me, I don't see it in that way. I really don't. <laughs> and of course, that's kind of relatively inconsequential, isn't it? But it's just a little glimpse of how we don't see things as they are. We see them as we are, or as as we sort of want them uh, to be, or, or as they sort of suit us. We see them in terms of their own use to us um, <clears throat> so really things aren't things at all really things are more like events uh, they sort of arise out of conditions and uh, fall away uh, they're actually sort of happening in time uh, we just see them as things there's my chair and I'll be shocked when it's broken and I'll be sad <laughs> uh, because I've misperceived it so um, can you see how really what I'm seeing is my mind? It's a mental impression. It's not really what's there. It's a mental impression that I have constructed um, out of my um, sort of need to use things for my own use. And actually what can happen um, if we start to see, if we start to evoke the, invoke this teaching, um, or sometimes when you're not even invoking this teaching, you can sort of break through uh, our misperception and see things more as they really are. Um, that's what happens in a moment of beauty. Uh, so just as meaning is a matter of consciousness, beauty too is suddenly a seeing of, of something uh, on its own terms or for its own sake. Suddenly we see uh, more vividly, more directly um, <clears throat> we see through the world as we are uh, and we actually see a bit more what's actually there so um, <clears throat> you might you might feel yeah well you know uh, how important is that you know that actually 
a lot of what we see is kind of uh, is mind. Um, you know, we can still get through life perfectly well, can't we? Uh, calling trees trees and chairs chairs and uh, feeling a bit sad when they break, but just getting a new one. Uh, and that's true. It, th th this sort of way of relating to the world is not it, it, it sort of works perfectly well, sort of functionally, doesn't it? But um, <clears throat> yeah, this, yeah, just two points to make here. Um, one is that what the Buddha is getting at with mind um, is all-encompassing. So what we tend to do is we tend to think of a real, uh, substantial, reliable world out there, and the mind in here as being somewhat unreliable. It sort of plays tricks on us. Um, <clears throat> uh, you know, you have funny little thoughts, but nobody knows. It's kind of quite irrelevant. Uh, and that leaves you with the impression that mind is not that important. It leaves you with the impression that you could possibly be enlightened, just work behind the, you know, as a cashier in Tesco's, and nobody would know about it. Well, that's not the Buddha's perspective. That's not what the Buddha was saying. The Buddha is saying that actually, uh, with enlightenment, uh, you change not just um, sort of in here. It changes the world, uh, your perception of the world, and. It changed them. Uh, if he was to come into communication with them to any degree, um, his experience of them was radically different from their experience of them. He was seeing them uh, vividly, clearly, not as he was, but as they actually are. And if he was to come into communication with them, that transformed them. So, um, this is that these are the implications of kind of transformation of mind so uh, something kind of much more all-encompassing is being got at here uh, with what what in uh, what the buddha meant uh, by mind uh, so that's important to mention and the other thing that's important about this mind perspective um, is that again it leaves us with the spiritual initiative there's only one person that can uh, get to grips with your mind that can change your mind and that is you so that is what why the buddha um encouraged this perspective um <clears throat> so the other thing to say about this this little formula this being that becomes um sabuti uh, very helpfully points out that what it is is an observation it's not a theory it's an observation so the Buddha is inviting us to actually look at our experience. If we look at the external world uh, with any profundity, we see that we misperceive it. We also have moments of beauty when we suddenly perceive it and we start to experience another kind of consciousness. So that's that's the first three niyamas um, <clears throat> and the uh, uh, possibility that the Buddha is getting at. Um, with what he says about this being that becomes. So, as I say, uh, he's he's in, he's impressing upon us that we have special spiritual initiative. We have the initiative to kind of fundamentally change our minds and therefore our experience and the world and the way we impact other people. So this moves uh, towards the karma niyama, uh, the next niyama, karma. I imagine everybody will have heard of, but it's basically saying it means the laws uh, that uh, pertain to um, intentional action or willed action or volitional action. Um, there's a, there is a, a reliable um, relationship between our intentional actions and the consequences of those actions. That's what he's saying have a look at this observe this in your own experience yeah so it's not again it's not a theory it's not a dogma it's an invitation to observe this explore this in your own experience so this is the basis the fundamental basis of buddhist ethics um, <clears throat> so um with Buddhist ethics, essentially, that this is what we're doing. We're sort of invoking this perspective um, of conditionality. Um, so we're seeing ourselves as a conditioned arising. We're seeing ourselves as a process. Um, <clears throat> Buddhist ethics, we approach our experience um, from this perspective. That's what we're really doing. And um, 
this is really not what we tend to do. It's really not. Uh, <laughs> um, we see our experience, we see ourselves from within the illusion of a fixed uh, self. Uh, this is how I am. Um, uh, of course, we can kind of step out of that, and that's what the Buddha is inviting us to do. But ping, we sort of, uh, without knowing it, we sort of uh, get back into it. And all of Buddhist uh, practice, all of Buddhist ethics, is uh, inviting us instead to see our experience as um, arising uh, independence upon the, the skillfulness or unskillfulness of our intentional action. Yeah. So if we act uh, on the basis of greed, hatred and delusion, our experience will kind of close down. We'll find ourselves more and more confined within a story, an illusory story of a fixed and stuck self. Uh, experience will be confined and will feel more and more cut off and isolated from other people. If we act on the basis of um, love, generosity and mental clarity, if we, if our actions are sort of uh, um, motivated um, by those motivations, motives, um, then consciousness will start to open up. So a little example of this for me, um, I've been exploring the area of generosity. Um, I sort of never quite warmed to generosity. <laughs> I know you're meant to, you're meant to be generous, aren't you? But uh, I just never quite sort of warmed to it. And um, uh, but last year, particularly, I was sort of reflecting on it um, uh, and trying to put it into practice, trying to explore what the Buddha is inviting us to observe. That if we act out on a basis of generosity. Uh, it affects the way uh, mind, it affects mind, the way mind opens up. So we can take spiritual initiative for our experience. Um, and um, I, I had an experience the other day. I, I just I just gave a friend last prayer, I gave him a bit of chocolate. I just sort of felt like uh, giving him that. Uh, so I did it. And um, it, it really affected me. It really, I, I was sort of taken aback. Um, it was a bit like a sort of it was one of these sort of moments of waking up so it's a little bit like we're, we're sort of um we're asleep we're in a dream a dream with a story of self uh, or a sort of illus illusion uh, of sort of being a fixed self and even as a buddhist you'll practice within that illusion so for me um you know work at the center very busy at the center lots to do and i get into this sort of doing lots of uh, good stuff you know a lot of it for other people um and then i've got all this stuff to do and i get sort of i get somewhat busy and think, oh god i've got a lot to do i start to get anxious about it start to get a bit sort of resource concerned am i gonna have the resources to do it and um i sort of narrow down without noticing it into a story of self kind of pitted against the to-do list <laughs> and um in this moment i sort of um i just i just gave for the sort of uh the joy of it for the um enjoyment of it i just gave some chocolate and um i was just in that moment sort of pulled out of this self i didn't even realize i'd sort of settled down into pulled out of this illusory self that i'm really busy and i've got all these things to do um starting to get anxious about it i was just sort of i woke up out of this dream oh god that's not true at all actually um suddenly I was sort of connected with other people as opposed to sort of pitted against life, against circumstances. Um, so it's in this way that, that through the practice of Buddhist ethics, we, we start to see that, that uh, our experience really arises in dependence upon um, our intentional action. And it starts to, it starts to um, erode the sort of illusions, the illusory stories uh, that we usually live, uh, well, that usually sort of guide, lead our habitual action, basically. So increasingly what you're doing as a Buddhist is kind of um, finding your confidence that actually that is more true. Uh, we tend to believe the stories, oh gosh, I'm really busy, I need to look after myself, this, this. and it's not like they're completely untrue, uh, but with, with uh, Buddhist Buddhist uh, practice, we're more and more relying on this deeper truth that all of our experience 
arises in dependence upon conditions and karma uh, is the condition that defines individualized consciousness yeah if we act skillfully consciousness opens up if we act unskillfully consciousness kind of closes down is and is uh, constricted restricted and in that moment of giving uh, meaning uh, I sort of sense there is a deeper meaning to consciousness um, so karma is is uh, is um, is this sort of experience this perception of the meaning the deeper meaning uh, that lies within life if we act in this way life on, uh, opens up in a sort of meaningful way we start to grow So I hope you can, I hope you're starting to see kind of what's being, what's what the Buddha is inviting us to sort of explore uh, as uh, the nature of consciousness. Um, <clears throat> he's saying, look at the external world. You, you misperceive it. Look at yourself. You misperceive it as fixed um, uh, with all the, you know your own particular sort of stories. Um, <clears throat> um, but actually, it's not like that. Look deeper. Um, he's inviting us to observe and then there is the Dharma Niyama um, so this is getting even more sort of um, mysterious really um, <clears throat> yeah so what's there about the Dharma Niyama so the Dharma Niyama is the the sort of um, um, the laws that um, under which human consciousness um, develops into Buddhas so in a way, the Buddha, uh, the Buddha has seen through, uh, well, not in a way, the Buddha has seen through the delusion of a fixed self. Um, <clears throat> karma uh, is action from, is willed action. So it's, 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 it's individual agency. Um, so if you let go of that, agency is interrupted. Something more mysterious starts to happen. Uh, it's not like Buddhas just go flaccid, <laughs> uh, they just sort of flop on the couch. Uh, they're actually sort of, uh, high, if you read, read about the Buddha's life, highly motivated, highly energetic uh, life. So what is it that motivates Buddhas? Um, so this is the sort of mysterious era of the Dharma Niyama. But again, the Buddha is inviting us to observe uh, in our experience. He's saying, he's not inviting us to, uh, to blind faith. He's saying, observe it in your own experience. You have the spiritual initiative. So a little, little example of this from my own experience. Um, when I was on solitary retreat um, a couple of years ago, um, I, uh, I do a... Um, recollection practice on a, a particular archetype a uh, particular visual image of enlightenment uh, female form actually uh, called Tara um, uh, which sort of evokes an aspect of enlightenment I do that every day um, and um, I just done that practice and something was arising for me in the retreat around the area of fear so Tara uh, is the image of fearlessness um, and compassion fearless compassion um, and i'd been it had been sort of impressing itself upon me this area of sort of fear insecurity uh, invulnerability that whole sort of area i can't quite remember the details of it now but in a moment i sort of i i realized something about that area that i can't i can't now articulate i had a realization a sort of mini insight into uh, the nature of that area and there was something as, as I started to I started to become aware that I was sort of seeing into something um, and simultaneously at that moment my head turned uh, my gaze sort of fell uh, onto the image of Tara uh, the gesture that she holds in her heart of fearlessness um, so it was this very, very odd moment of sort of inner realization simultaneously reflected uh, in what was happening unconsciously in the external world. There was this sort of coincidence of inner world and outer world. Um, and I sensed there was something sort of, there was something going on. There was some sort of strange logic, uncanny logic, um, 
Now, of course, this is the sort of area of, of sort of fantasy, isn't it? Um, potential area of sort of fantasy. We could be sort of kidding ourselves, but um, uh, it wasn't really like that. I, I, I have, I mean, I have experienced that. I, um, but generally, that's accompanied with a sort of slightly a sort of anxiety for something to be something to happen or something to be true. Well, this was uh, this was a, a sort of un, um, uh, as disinterested as, as watching the kettle boil. Um, it was just something very mysterious kind of happening, a mysterious sort of coincidence, a, a mysterious sort of experience of simultaneity. Or, I don't think that's a word, is it? But anyway, um, and it's not that there's anything sort of, you know, uh, groundbreaking about this experience, but it was just it was just a little experience of some kind of some kind of logic, uh, some kind of process that is um, uh, beyond it. It was sort of happening beyond me, if you see what I mean. It wasn't something that was coming from my willed action. Um, yeah, so um, this is the this is that that is a sort of reflection of a reflection of processes that are sort of beyond our comprehension, but are experienced in consciousness. Uh, so we can observe these in consciousness. Um, it's the sort of thing. Sometimes people have experiences of sort of saying exactly the right thing uh, to a friend. Uh, it was un unpremeditated. Suddenly something comes out. They don't know quite why they've said it. Um, well, that again is sort of beyond uh, willed action, isn't it? There's something of a different order uh, at play there, and that's what's been got up with the Dharma Niyama. And it's these processes uh, that are experienced, sort of, they're experienced as outside of self. They're actually beyond the duality of agency and passivity. Um, that's something um, that can arise um, when. Uh, we let go of self when self is let go of. So this is what the Buddha. This is what the Buddha means by this. This being that becomes through arising. This that arises. Um, he's saying, look, observe in your experience in these different spheres of experience. Um, there is a pattern. Uh, there is a pattern to consciousness. Consciousness can open up, and if you do that, uh, you will start to get some sort of intimation. Of the possibility of enlightenment, uh, you get so, start to get some intimation of what I have experienced. That's what the Buddha is saying. But one thing to say about this is there is a difference. Uh, so what we do is we get a glimpse, we get a vision, we get a vision of another kind of consciousness in these sort of moments, and then we fall back uh, into our ordinary consciousness. It's not like that for the Buddha. For the Buddha, this is not a vision. Uh, this is. Uh, the nature, the very character of his consciousness. So um, <clears throat> this is really, really important to uh, to bear in mind uh, because as soon as we start to think we've understood enlightenment, we've misunderstood it. Uh, it's beyond our comprehension. So um, we need to have a sense of how impossible it is actually to imagine another kind of consciousness. In, when we're reflecting about enlightenment, when we're considering enlightenment, we need to have a sense of how impossible it is to imagine another kind of consciousness. So a, a little um, example of this, because this is true in our own experience. Um, um, when I was about 17, I remember just hanging around with a few friends at school and we were, we were sort of uh, sharing stories about third formers. Uh, so we were like, we were like 17 and they'd be like, what would they be, 13 or something like that. And we were, you know, sort of in awe of how old we were. You know, we thought we knew all, uh, as you do. Um, and how sort of, um, how silly the sort of preoccupation, pre preoccupations are of third formers. And uh, just as we were talking about this, this, this memory, this memory of two third formers uh, going up to the biggest boy in the school. Um, and uh, to ask him if he was the biggest boy in the school, <laughs> I sort of just just laughing to myself. But I hesitated before I said it. And then I realized, oh, my God, that was me. That was me. Um, and I just couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe I had I had so dissociated from it as another kind of consciousness that I had 
initially remembered it as someone else, but it was actually me. It was actually me that did it. Um, so there's this sort of huge gulf of consciousness, even just, uh, you know, over the space of five years, such that I remember, I remember the, the, the big boy. <laughs> he was quite big, I tell you. Uh, I remember the big boy, um, his sort of disdain, at our sort of, you know, question, his sort of, and uh, I, I, as a 17 year old, I then realized what was going on for him. I could have no sense as a 13 year old of what that disdain was about. You know, but as a 17 year old, I was like sort of horrified, you know, I, I didn't tell anyone about it. You know, so embarrassed, so embarrassed. It's silly, isn't it? But um, yeah, I was just sort of horrified um, as a 17 year old at how, you know, how immature um, uh, my sort of concerns, my preoccupations were. So. I think if we start to if we start to realise um, how much our experience is defined by a level of consciousness, and how much we can't really imagine uh, another kind of consciousness, we can't really imagine enlightenment. It's then that we can start to get a sense of it. We can start to get a sense of how far beyond us um, consciousness can be. Yeah. So I think that's really important to sort of bear in mind with this, um, <clears throat> that the Buddha can give us a vision of his consciousness, but actually he's not talking about a vision. He's, t he's describing his consciousness, a consciousness that we can't quite imagine. But if we start to realize that, then we can start to imagine it. And this consciousness that he's talking about is the basis for all meaning or beauty um, in human life. So um, <clears throat> what I, the way I want to finish is actually um, if we salute the shrine again. So um, uh, sorry, those of you who are at what is a mitra, um, but I want us just to, this is really what saluting the shrine is about. It's about coming, it's about imagining another kind of consciousness. So what I want to do is we're just gonna salute the shrine and then we'll go into groups and we'll just talk about the experience of saluting a shrine, we'll talk about the experience of actually, possibly, intimating or coming into relationship, imaginative relationship with another kind of consciousness. Um, it's that vision uh, that gives meaning and inspires um, our practice of Buddhism. So that's what we do. So if you just like to prepare yourself um, <clears throat> to salute the shrine, obviously do this by your own choosing but let's just let's just give it a go don't it doesn't matter what happens let's just give it a go and really attend to the experience of it let's just really stay in experience and we're just in unison salute in these strange words close to the language of the buddha 2500 years ago we we'll salute the buddha the dharma and the sangha and then we'll bow and just stay with the experience Namo Buddhaya Namo Dharmaya Namo Sanghaya Namo 